During the summer of 2008, we ran a field school in British Columbia on the Sunshine Coast. It was a collaborative project with the Tuyama First Nation. Let's see what happened. The 2008 Tla'aman Field School included a survey in the intertidal zone. We looked for clam gardens, fish traps, canoe skids, and other features on the foreshore between the low and high tide levels. There's a lot of different kinds of uh, modification in the intertidal zone that we've been finding during this survey and that archaeologists have found on other, um, in other places and other times. Mm -hmm. um, actually, you can see just across from us, just across from the water, there's some boulders um, some big bedrock outcrops with seaweed on them. Mm -hmm. um, just a little bit lower in the, in the intertidal column down below where the water's at now. There's some really big areas, looks like all of the boulders have been moved aside um, to create better clam habitat, mm -hmm. possibly. We're not 100% sure what we're still doing. People are still trying to do research on these and understand them, but that's what it looks like, and that's what we've been told by some of the people who um, had that experience um, mm -hmm. when they were young, having their grannies tell them to move the stones away from um, clamming areas. Experts from different fields, including marine biology, archaeology, and geomorphology, collaborated to try to arrive at a better understanding of clam gardens. These guys, the clam guys, have shown that at higher temperatures you get faster production, faster growth rates of the clams. And I don't know how far you can push that, um, but maybe it gets you get really fast growth rate of the clams here. And, yeah, we talked about that. And and so. So the broken clams grow. So the, the standing water somehow increases productivity. Well, kind of that's terms? I'm just I, my hypothesis. All I'm saying it's a known relationship that war, that the clam guys say that warmer waters of the Strait of Georgia result in faster growing clams. So this would be warmer still. This would be warmer still. Oh. It, the fire plant does better in warmer water, though, right? Well, or not? Um, that totally depends on the oceanography of the system. So. Uh -huh. I mean, there's some places where you have great upwelling and lots of nutrients, and the water's nice and cool. Yes. But if you don't have a lot of the other elements yes. that you need for phytoplankton to grow, the other limiting things like iron, for instance, you, you have high nitrates, but you don't have a lot of phytoplankton growth. In places where you see a lot of phytoplankton growth, they've drawn down a lot of those nitrates, and um, now. You don't, you, know, you don't see high nitrates, but you do get a lot of phytoplankton, and growth does saturate over time. So yes. we were talking about that last night in New Zealand, where we planted filter feeders, mussels in New Zealand. You do see greater growth rates in places where the um, oceanography allows that phytoplankton to hang around for a long time. Where there's that upwelling, you often get the like, boom and busts yes. yeah. of phytoplankton, probably like around Johnson Strait, but in places where water's retained and there's maybe either it's stratified because of temperature or salinity, the phytoplankton's there and these oysters or mussels or clams can take advantage of this constant food supply and thus can um, If you, you think about you having a slope and a water level or whatever, um, at some point you have mud being deposited mm -hmm. or whatever and the lower energy site that you have, that mm -hmm. higher the mud line comes and sometimes uh, I've seen really protected places where your mud line is coming up even into the intertidal and maybe it's just mud that's covering up all the rocks down there mm -hmm. that we have a high mud line because it's so protected. So I'm, I'm just no, let's being, no, let's put that out. It's well, great. So, but let's look nice. at like an isolated one that's higher. It's also nice, I guess, to think of all the alternative no, it's totally, that it's can, that can create well, these things. Well, and the mm -hmm. only reason I say that is, is so maybe the slope goes down underneath here, especially like over here, and what we see is something that looks like a platform, but it's actually just a mud line coming in here. Maybe a sea level's come up with it. The Tla'aman people have been harvesting clams for centuries, but now their access to this resource is limited due to oyster leases and government regulations. Now you can't go and look for it because you're restricted. There's government rules and regulations where you can go. You can't go here, you can't go there. But our people go to the beach over in um, around Grace Harbor area there now. They can't get onto the beach because it's all oyster leases. 
you know, get off, get off my land. This is my land. Our people have been threatened going there to gather clams. Oysters is new to us. It's not, uh, you know, wasn't here before. I don't know where it came from, when it arrived. I remember hearing the old timers say they don't recognize this new kind of shellfish. Malaspian complex that we were working in is this huge oyster production area and there's all sorts of introduced species that are going on there. We've, there's oysters everywhere, but I mean originally the, 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 the oyster population was minimal, if any at all, and it's just the oysters that have left leases that are all over the space and I mean, you just encounter them everywhere you go. Um, so, I mean, what originally would have been like largely you know, clam based shell or yeah. shellfish, like, like a clam variety, would have been encountered. It's, you know, oysters everywhere you look. As well as clams, the Tla'aman people caught fish, such as herring and salmon, by constructing fish traps in the intertidal zone. Um, we're also seeing things uh, just around the corner from where we are. Um, it looks like a fish trap. So we have a, a large basin probably mostly more or less naturally formed. But then on the sides of it, people have piled up boulders um, to block um, the exits. So when the water tide comes up, it fills with water, and then the water will stay when the tide goes down, and there's small little constricted outlets. So the water will only flow through those channels, and so people can block them as needed to uh, prevent fish from escaping. Um, so those are just a couple of the kinds of intertidal modifications that we've found during this survey. We've been making sure to make sure that we're on the shoreline whenever we get low tides so that we can have a look and try to see how, what kinds of things people have been doing in the, in the landscape to make it more, more perfect for what they want and what they need. Mm -hmm. This time-lapse video was taken on the beachfront of the Tla'aman Reserve. Watch as the tide comes in, accentuating the stone fish traps. These ancient features demonstrate an understanding of intertidal ecology and traditional knowledge of marine biology. The features are now eroded, but would have stood just over a meter high, trapping large numbers of fish of various species. These intertidal features supported dense populations for many, many years. We've learned a lot this summer about the numerous features found in the intertidal zone of the Tla'aman's traditional territory, but there's still more to learn. That's why we are going back to Tla'aman territory next summer. If you want more information or want to enroll in the field school, go to www.sfu.ca slash archaeology slash fieldschools slash index.html.